This guy, Jack Foley, he invented a whole nother range of sound design back in the 1930s. Live sound created by someone other than the performers on stage is often called Foley. Named after Jack Foley, the Foley artist creates live sound effects that mimic the sounds one would hear during the performance. This could be in radio, television, movies, or in live theater. One of the most well-known theatrical uses of the Foley artist is for the play Our Town, because sometimes we'll put the Foley artist on stage. After all, it's a play about a play. Uh, you know, you have the stage manager narrating. Though I didn't see it, the Broadway production of SpongeBob SquarePants used a percussionist to create all those animation punctuation sounds. Um, and this percussionist performer was on stage. Uh, recorded sound effects um, and or backing tracks are usually delivered via the sound system by the front of house audio engineer. I use the term engineer loosely as we're not actually licensed engineers. Uh, but the front of house mixing operator, you know, that, that person that has their fingers on the board the entire time is quite busy. Now, delivering the recorded sound might be coming from tape decks, from CDs, mini discs, a record, uh, or currently we're using computers. Now, for both theater and film, it starts with a performer and it goes, you know, the input is they, they're, they're talking. And like this guy with the megaphone, you're talking into one end. We usually talk into microphones. Um, so the microphone is the input. And then it's going to go through a processor of various types. Uh, it could be just the mixing board. It could be EQs and other things. And then it's going to go through a, an output and ultimately to the speakers. So here's an illustration of some inputs. We've got several microphones and we have a piano keyboard as an example. And they're all going to go into a mixer. Now the mixer is going to combine it and, and change levels. And then it's going to send it out to the amplifiers or to a powered speaker. We'll discuss that momentarily. And the amplifier is going to send it out to the house speaker system. Most of the time, house speaker systems do need amplifiers uh, as they're considered passive speaker boxes. Let's look at the microphones first as our main input source. First, we have uh, something for wide close-up uh, work. Um, this one is one of my favorites. It's a PCC 160 floor mic by Crown. Um, you put this, a lot of people put it at the edge of the stage and it picks up sound from the middle stage on up to the edge. For say, people that are further away, using a shotgun microphone comes in handy. We can hang this from above and point it down uh, over the heads of the people that are in front and pick up people who are upstage. We're going to do some layouts in future classes of, of looking at how we lay out our systems on, on paper. Uh, the last one is the infamous SM58 microphone from Shure. It's a personal handheld mic. You would hold it up close. Um, this is similar to it, but it's by a different company. So you would hold it up here. Um, a lot of rock and roll singers, as you know, will use it. It's on all the shows uh, for concerts and such. But we don't use it a whole lot on stage for our use. Though there are certain examples. What we use most often for musicals is a wireless belt pack with a small microphone that can go over the ear um, or in the hairline. The black one in this picture would go down in the hairline and you would, can get these in whatever color you need in order to blend in with the performer. Uh, the lighter color one you can also color with a set of pens that you can get to match people's skin tones. Uh, what I try to avoid is having people tape it, the microphone here on their cheek. It gets really distracting. For me, if I needed to get the mic really close, I'd probably put in the beard and have it just stick out a little bit. Um, or up here to the side, you know, up here you're going to see it because I don't have a lot there. But over here you could hide it. Um, microphone placement can vary depending on who the performer is. Different microphones will pick up different people in different ways and that's something that a sound designer, uh, as they gain more experience, will learn along the way. Here's a musical instrument. It's just a piano keyboard. And you can plug this directly into the mixer and take that signal in and mix it with the other stuff and then send it out to the speakers. Some musical instruments, though, uh, it's better to mic them separately. For example, this guitar amp. Uh, 
I swiped this image from Sweetwater, thank you to them, and uh, it's a guitar amp with a speaker in it, and it has a microphone that's pointing towards the speaker cone. In future class classes here on stage seminars, we're going to examine where on the speaker cone to put the mic. But if you have this equipment, you should play with it. Move the mic around and, and point it straight at the speaker cone or point it from an off angle of the speaker cone or point it to the side of the speaker cone. They'll all sound different. There's a lot of YouTube videos. We're going to watch a couple of them together at some point and unpack what they're talking about. Other inputs uh, we're using for sound playback, we're all using computers nowadays. Um, are you using computers? I'm going to take a poll momentarily, but here's an old picture of a computer plus a picture of an iPad with a computer program to pl do playback. We can use iPods, iPads, and so on, uh, and even MP3 players. Okay, the next slide has my results from Facebook. I took a poll on Facebook. Now, these two programs, one is QLab and one is SFX. QLab works on the Mac and SFX works on Windows. And our poll results here show us that QLab has 197 votes while SFX has eight. Uh, I've used both and QLab is, is much more modern, I have to say, and again, works on a Mac. Uh, these other three packages that are between QLab and SFX, I have not used. But we're going to explore them, and I'm going to find people that can offer us some training so we can learn how well they work. Do you have tutorials for any of these that you like? Send them along, and we'll watch them together. Other playback devices. Now we're going back a ways. Does anybody have a cassette deck or a CD player? I'm sure several high school and middle school booths have these still installed. And if they work, they work. It's like lighting devices. You know, people ask me, what's your favorite lighting instrument? And I say, well, A, the one that'll do the job, and B, if it spits out light, I'll figure out how to use it. If it spits out sound, we can figure out how to use it. Now, tape players are a little bit noisier nowadays compared to CDs and certainly compared to digital devices because there's an underlying noise or a hiss that can be on the tape. But you can still process that anyway. 